Still filling that out? I'll give you time. It matters to us. I know I, the only way, here's what we did, had a staff meeting this week. We decided the only way to get you to do this is if I ask you and we give you time in the service. So that's what we're doing. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, thank you that you are indeed our living hope. Sometimes we place our hope in other things, in other people, and it always disappoints us. So as we come now together as your people, remind us of the hope we have in you. Speak to us through your word. Encourage our hearts because we need that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Several months ago, I, I shared this with all of you as a church family from the pulpit, and many of you have been following online. I found out that my uh, administrative assistant, Jenny Caterer, uh, who had always wanted to be a mom, was blessed with a beautiful baby girl, Kylie Joy. And then uh, on maternity leave, found out that she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a dire uh, prognosis. Going through treatment, hoping to have stem cell transplant and praying, continue to pray that God would heal her. About a month after that, I was in Arizona with visiting my parents, and we saw on the, watched on news with shock as Russia invaded Ukraine. Couldn't believe it was actually happening. And all of you know, as the weeks and months unfolded, the refugee crisis, the loss of life, the atrocities. Then I read about um, the extreme oppression. A friend of mine who's a missionary in China sent me an article about the extreme oppression and near genocide of the Uyghur people in China. Nobody writes about this or talks about this. It's not in the news very often, but it's horrific what's going on with the Uyghur people who are being slow, systematically sterilized and exterminated. And then just two weeks ago, uh, we were on an executive council and leadership team retreat in Lake Geneva, and uh, that Saturday evening I heard there was a shooting in Buffalo. Didn't know much about it, and woke up, preached the sermon Sunday morning, and then uh, that evening found out more that an 18-year-old white man, fueled with lies and racial hatred, drove miles and miles to an African-American community, entered a grocery store, shot and killed 10 people. Just this past week, or a week and a half ago, I sat with dear friends in a hospital room where he's waiting for a diagnosis. He was with his family on a little vacation with his girls and came back and couldn't catch his breath and found out blood clots in his lungs and then waiting to find out, is it cancer or not? Just sitting there waiting and praying that it wouldn't be. And it is. And this week, finding out that a Geneva High School senior girl days before her graduation, end her life. I consider myself a pretty upbeat, uh, optimistic person, and I'm fairly hard to discourage. My wife tells me that I'm just a dreamer and sunny all the time. You know? But sometimes it gets to you, doesn't it? Sometimes the world is a dark place, and there's a lot of brokenness, and I just named a few things, and you could make your own list. We all have ours. But what do you do with this? As followers of Jesus, what do we do when we look out at the world and there's just darkness and brokenness and awful things happen? Jesus, or Peter tells us something in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. He says, For to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. I'm going to guess that's not a verse you see on a fridge magnet, on the back of cars, on Instagram posts, all flowered up, right? Jesus suffered, and guess what? You get to do the same. Follow me to a life of suffering. Who's in? As we noted, we all suffer in some capacity in this life. We don't all suffer in the same way. There are degrees from our human perspective, but nobody gets a pass. All of us suffer in some way, and we all see and are touched by it. So here's the question. How do we make sense of suffering? As followers of Jesus, do we put our heads in the sand, pretend it doesn't happen? Do we act like it's not real? Do we live in denial? How do we make sense of suffering as followers of Christ? Because it is real. It does happen. 
This is the question Paul is answering in his passage from Romans 8. Uh, how are Christians supposed to think about and respond to the brokenness of the world? Now, Paul knew a thing or two about suffering. In 2 Corinthians 11, he goes through and like, lists his suffering resume, all the things he'd endured. Being beaten, being starved, being oppressed, persecuted, shipwrecked. So he's not writing about this from like a, an academic, theoretical, or abstract perspective. He lived a life of hardship and sacrifice, yet when you read his letters, they're full of joy and hope. How do you put those together? How do those connect? Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25, as we continue in our series on the greatest chapter. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. I say this every week, but Paul packs so much into so, these verses that I, I tremble every week. I'm like, how am we possibly going to unpack all of this? We're not going to. We're just going to skim the surface. And I encourage you to keep reading and meditating on these verses. We'll do the best that we can with the time that we have. I'm amazed at Paul's clarity and power of his words. And one of the things that he does that's amazing is he anticipates questions that we, his hearers and readers, might have. And in verse 17, he says, if we suffer with Christ, we'll be glorified with him. And we might think, question, well, what does suffering and glory have to do with each other? And he's answering that question in the passage I just read, 18 to 25. This is what he's talking about. The first thing we see is we must put suffering in its proper context. Christians don't live in denial about the reality of suffering. We follow a suffering savior, a suffering servant. Our Lord Jesus suffered in ways that we can't even fathom. So we're not pretending it doesn't exist. Sometimes Christians are accused of that. But we don't see or think about suffering the same way as those who do not believe. It's in a different context for us. Look at verses 18 and 19 once more. For I consider, Paul says. Now, the word consider is a key word. It's a Greek word, logizomai. We get our English word logic from this. But it literally means to properly account for. To place in the right, and sometimes it's used, the root word is used in accounting in the ancient world. To put on the right side of the ledger to balance out accurately, to reckon with properly. For I consider, I think about accurately, what? That the sufferings of this present time, and he doesn't mean the moment he's writing the letter, he means this life. And everyone who has ever read this letter since Paul wrote it can say the same thing. So the collective sufferings of the life that we live are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That's, that's amazing. They're not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Doesn't say they're not real, but when you think about them in context, they don't even compare. This is a, a profound statement. An overwhelming statement if you think about it. Paul is saying that if you could somehow quantify and add up all of the collective human suffering from natural disasters, from disease, from war, from death, from suicide, from uh, oppression, from uh, injustice, just if you could, slavery, just heap it all up, it's, it would be staggering. It would be, it would, it's, it, you can't even get your mind around what that is, what that would amount to. He says, if you could, it wouldn't even compare to what? 
to the glory that will be revealed. But most of us just don't believe that because we, we think this life that we're living right now, this present time, is ultimate, that it's all that matters, and it isn't. I, I saw this example from a pastor named Francis Chan. Oh, and can you give me a hand here, buddy? Yeah. He uh, used this analogy. Maybe you've seen this before. My friend Owen's going to help me. Owen's going to take this into the rope and go as far back in the room as you can. There we go. Keep going. All the way back there. Don't hit anybody in the head with it. Okay. I might have to move here. Here's what we're going to do. Keep walking, Owen, but don't pull me off the stage. Okay. We'll go over here. All the way back. Watch, this will be like Christmas lights and it won't work. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All the way back. Keep going, Owen. Got more rope here. All the way back there, back. Now just reel it out there. Okay, so we'll just use this. Thanks, Owen. This rope represents eternity. It's only 75 feet long, but just hang with me. And this piece of tape represents the suffering of this present time. The life we're living. Paul says, this suffering's real. It exists. But it's not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. We just live as if this is all there is, right? This is it. And so it feels ultimate to us. He's not saying, he's not living in denial. He's saying we need to account for the brokenness of this world in its proper context. It's right here. Compared to what's coming, it doesn't even compare. Thanks, Owen. You can just drop it right there. So he says, for I consider, I think accurately about what we're facing. And in light of eternity, of what God will one day do, it doesn't even compare. I'll be honest. I don't always live like that. In the hospital room, getting the phone call, sitting with people, finding out about the atrocities and what the, the tragedies, it doesn't feel like that. But Paul says, don't trust those feelings. You need to account for it in its proper place. In other words, we gotta put it inside the story in which it makes sense. Speaking of the story, that's what Paul does. He gives us a story in which suffering makes sense. And I'll, it doesn't always because our minds are finite and we hurt. But what is the story? First, the first thing about the story is what we're gonna call the great groaning. Uh, yeah, let me read this for you. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. This phrase, weight of glory, the word glory, actually the root word means weight. And if you wanna read a great essay, go read C.S. Lewis's essay, The Weight of Glory. From, taken from that very phrase. Doesn't compare, he's saying. Okay, the great groaning. I don't know if you caught it in the story. Did you hear in, in Paul's text? There's a lot of groaning going on. Creation is growing, groaning. We are groaning. And we find out in the sermon next week that the spirit is groaning inside of us. The word groaning is sustenetzo. It means um, collective um, sigh over a pain experience together. Creation, all creation together is groaning and crying out because something's wrong. Look at verses 20 through 21. For creation was subjected to futility. A couple phrases here. Subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Who's the him? Well, ultimately, God placed the curse on creation, but we are the ones who sinned. Adam sinned. Because of his sin, because of his disobedience, all of creation was impacted, subjected to futility, in hope that the creation will be, be set free from its bondage to corruption. That's the second phrase I want you to see. Bondage to corruption. And obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Go back one slide. There, stay there. That's good. So, Creation, like people, is beautiful, made in God, by God, it's good, it's meant to reflect his glory, but it's gone wrong. Not because it did something wrong, because we did. And it's groaning to be set right. The phrase subjected to futility, meaning it's, it cannot accomplish its created and intended purpose. 
God, in Romans chapter one, we're told that since the beginning, God's invisible qualities, his divine nature have been on display from what has been made. So part of creation's intended purpose is to tell us something about the nature of God. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, the skies are proclaiming his handiwork. They're pouring forth speech. So creation is meant to say something to us about who God is and what he's like. But creation is also meant to be a world in which we live in harmony and in peace with God, with each other, and with all of nature. Because of our sin and rebellion, creation can't accomplish fully its intended purpose, subjected to futility. We're supposed to be caretakers of it, tenders of the garden. We messed that up. The second phrase, bondage to corruption. It's stuck in this state of corruption and decay. Those of you who are scientists here, or you might remember from your physics class, the second law of thermodynamics. Anybody know what that is? The law of entropy? That things are moving from a state of order to disorder, losing energy. The, the universe is, this is happening. Things are breaking down. The second law of thermodynamics is happening in your body, right? Yesterday, I helped my daughter move into her new town home, and I put Ikea furniture together for two and a half hours. I feel the second law of thermodynamics happening in my body. By the way, that's like whoever, the Swedish people are cruel. I was like, Ugh. You put those little pegs in the wrong hole and they can't get it out. Oh, curse you. Anyway. <laughs> that wasn't in the notes. <laughs> so, so it's, the, the universe is, things are breaking down. Your body's breaking down. This world's breaking down. This, this doesn't mean that every wildfire or tornado or hurricane or natural disaster is a direct result of God's judgment for a particular sin. That's a mistake to think theologically that that's true. God's not saying, I'm going to wipe out this part of the world because of some person's sin. But collectively, because of human sin, the world is broken. And we see evidence of that in creation all the time. We see evidence of it in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own minds, and out in the world. There are some who say there's no point or purpose or meaning to the universe. It just is. And so therefore there would be no point or purpose or meaning to suffering. It just is. Here's what C.S. Lewis has to say about that. My argument against God, so Lewis famously said, I, was, I, did, not believe God, I did not believe God existed and I was mad at him for not existing as an atheist. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. Just as if, as if there were no light in the universe and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know what it was dark. Dark would be a word without meaning. You follow him? Even our groaning, even our groaning that it should be different than it is, is pointing us to something, that it will be different one day, that different is possible. Even the sense you have deep inside, creation groans and you and I groan for things to be different. And this week, as I was thinking through all the tragedy and hardship and sorrow, I felt that groaning. That itself is a sign that one day it will be. That the world wasn't made to be this way. There is meaning behind it, even if we can't always see it. It doesn't make sense to us. Look at verse 22. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. That's a fascinating phrase. Paul uses this groaning of birth pains he says. Why? Because childbirth is painful, but it's pain with a purpose. Something is coming. Life is coming. You're groaning over the beginning of something, not the end. If you're in a hospital ward and you hear somebody loudly groaning, it makes all the difference if you're in the maternity ward or in the oncology unit, doesn't it? It matters. What does that groan about? What does it mean? 
I did a funeral for a man named Dwight Link. I've been part of our church for many years recently, and he was in the hospital at the end of his days, and he watched the sermon from Palm Sunday where we talked about Jesus' words on the cross, it is finished. And he was convinced that he wasn't going to survive or make it out of the hospital, that his life was going to end there. And so he started pulling out his oxygen tube and his IV and crying out, it is finished in the hospital. The nurse said, listen, uh, Mr. Link, that's not what we want to hear on the hospital ward. And somebody yelling, it is finished. (laughs) We had to tell him, listen, if God's going to take you, you don't have to do anything to accelerate the process. Just So Paul uses this imagery. And in verse 19, he says, creation waits with eager expectation or longing. The images of somebody that craning their neck, looking forward to see what's coming. So there's a personification happening here of creation, that the created order, the natural world, is longing and looking and groaning for something to happen. What is that something? The revealing of the children of God. What does that mean? And what will it be like when that happens? Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9 gives us a hint. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion, the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. I don't know why, but I've been watching YouTube videos lately about animals attacking other animals. I don't know what that says about me. (laughs) So this is like, this would be different if this happens. And the cow and the bear shall graze, the young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Meaning the world will exist in harmony and peace and unity in a way that's beyond our comprehension now. Perfect harmony. Isaiah 65 verse 17 says, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and then the former things will be remembered no more. Second Chronicles chapter 16 verse 33, we read this. Then shall the trees clap their hands and dance and sing for joy when he comes to judge the earth. I think passages like this from Isaiah and 1 Chronicles were informing the imagination of C.S. Lewis when he talked about Narnia waking up when Aslan comes back. Creation. And we do get glimpses of God's glory now. Mountain views, sunrises, sunsets. But they're just, we see through a glass darkly. They're broken lights. Alfred Lord Tennyson uh, wrote in his poem, In Memoriam, Our little systems have their day. They have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee, and thou, O Lord, art more than they. So we just get these broken lights of, of God's glory. But one day, it'll be remade in a way that will just be overwhelming, reflecting his glory. Almost incomprehensible to us now. And creation is not the only one groaning. We're also groaning. We're groaning too. And, and creation's restoration is linked to ours. This is the great redemption. The great redemption. The culmination of everything Paul has been talking about, specifically our redemption, coming, is happening here. So there's the great groaning, and then there's a the great redemption. And Paul's talking about this in chapter 8, verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, a couple weeks ago, we looked at the, the spirit of adoption. We are already adopted as sons and daughters of God. That's already happened. But it's not yet fully realized. We struggle to live that way, to believe that, and it isn't fully here yet. And someday it will be. This is not something you bring about by your effort that you create. Paul is talking about when Christ returns, you will be fully redeemed, fully restored. And creation is waiting for that day because your restoration and its restoration are linked together. So when Paul says creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, he doesn't mean creation is just waiting for you Christians to get your act together and be better about the environment. We should care about the environment because God made the world. We should be the most environmentally conscious, but that's not what it's talking about. It's saying someday Christ will return and do what you cannot do, and that's why you groan. You groan for his return. The redemption of our bodies. So we're not groaning for a dream house. I mentioned my daughter bought a townhome and she's been, it's a terrible time to buy, but she didn't want to rent anymore. And so looking for the, the right 
home. Some of you think about, if we could just get a different, uh, relocate. A dream house, a dream spouse, a dream job. That's not, a, that's not what we should be groaning for as Christians. That's petty, small-minded stuff in light of eternity. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 to 44. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. The resurrection. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. You will receive a spiritual body. If you're in Christ one day, uh, we, will, we will receive. And it doesn't mean like you at your best. Like what, what, what age would that be? 21, 25, 12? I don't know. Like what's, what's, when were you physically at your best, your peak? I'm on the down slope now, so many of you I can tell by looking, right? <laughs> we're all in the same boat. But that's not what it means. It means someday you're going to be restored, redeemed, given a new body that never decays. There's no disease, no more COVID, no pandemic, no cancer cells ever grow. No, no, nothing corrupts it. Imperishable, perfect, glorified, revealed. And all creation will see they belong to him. Men and women in their resurrection bodies, the world will, re right now we're kind of hidden. But one day revealed. Lewis in his essay, The Weight of Glory, says, every one of us is on our way to one of two destinations, becoming what he calls an everlasting splendor or an eternal horror. That's where we're headed. That's what Paul's talking about, our, the great redemption. That's why we groan. Okay, last, the great hope. A great hope. In, 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 in uh, verse 24 of chapter 7, Paul says, Who will rescue me from this body of death? Physical body, temptation, suffering, and sorrow. In verse 11, last week we looked at, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, how will he not also give life to your mortal bodies? And then, he, and then we see again at the end in verse 23, We groan inwardly, awaiting our adoption as the sons and daughters of God. There's this progression here that's happening. And then Paul says in verse 24 and 25, for in this hope, this is a great phrase, in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Paul says, in this hope, we were, when, you were, when you came to faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. That means you're justified. You're made right in the sight of God. That's done. You don't hope for that. You have that. And we're also told the Spirit of God comes and dwells in you. You don't hope for that. You have that. But we're also saved into a hope. Hope in English sounds like... Um, like I hope the bears aren't terrible this year. Like that's not gonna really work out, you know? It's, a, it's sort of a vague wish that things would go the way I want. That is not biblical hope. The nature of biblical hope is a future certainty based on present reality. You are justified, you have the spirit as a down payment, a deposit guaranteeing what's to come. Therefore you hope with a clarity and a certainty that this will happen. This is a sure thing. I know you don't see it. I know at times it feels like the world is so broken, it's overwhelming, but I know that it's true. And I put these sufferings in their proper context in light of eternal glory because I know what's coming. That's why I groan, and that's why I hope. That's where my hope is. This side of the grave were foreigners and, and strangers. That side will be citizens. This side were orphans. That side adopted sons, daughters, and heirs. This side were hidden, that side fully revealed. And here's the great thing about biblical hope. It's just not out there. Biblical hope runs from the future back into the present. If, you're, if you understand what Paul's saying here, he's saying that future hope runs back into your heart now and fills you and enables you to walk with faith and confidence and joy in the midst of a broken world that is groaning. Elizabeth Elliot says it this way, the secret to the Christian life is Christ in me, not me in a different set of circumstances. Isn't that good? Most of us are wanting things to be different. If only I was, if only, if only, and one day they will be, 
But the secret to walking with Jesus is not you in new circumstances. It's Christ in you right now. Paul says it this way in Colossians chapter 1. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of, his, of this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's what he's after. I don't have an answer to you for why all these awful things I listed at the beginning happen, specifically right now. I don't think that's what the gospel offers us. A one-to-one -one why for every terrible thing. What it offers us is hope. An acknowledgement of the groaning. Placing those sufferings in their proper context. And trusting the, the sure and certainty of Christ's return. The redemption of our bodies the restoration of creation, the elimination of all the brokenness. Between this day and that day, we walk by faith, not by sight. I'm going to pray, and then Daniel has written a song um, about Romans 8. He, he sat down, he found out we're, we're teaching on Romans 8, and he said, I've written a song, I'd like to share it with you. Send it to me. I'm like, you have to play that for, our, for, for us. And so they're going to do that after I pray. And I just want you to, to soak it in as they sing about the glory of Romans 8 for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the power that's contained in these truths. We confess that sometimes the brokenness of the world is overwhelming to us and we lose sight and we lose hope. Thank you that you've given us the tools and the resources to place the suffering of this present life in its proper perspective, not to deny it or ignore it, but to see it in light of the future glory and to trust you right now, Christ in us, our hope of glory. We give you all the praise in your name. Amen. <laughs> what a great gift. Let's stand together for the benediction. I get to hear it again next hour. If you are here this morning and you got your own groaning going on, you'd like someone to pray with you, to intercede with you, members of our prayer team are in the classroom right out back. I'd love to meet with you at the close of the service uh, to pray with you and to pray for you. Now may we go in the grace, freedom, hope, and joy of knowing that we are indeed heirs with Christ. In the midst of the darkness, Lord, we give you all the praise and glory because we know what is to come. We say it in Jesus' name, amen.